All right, well, let's get started. So thank you, uh, Rudy, for uh, doing this. Uh, my name is Dustin uh, J. Bird. I'm an associate professor of philosophy and religion at Olivet College. I'm also the editor-in-chief of Ekperosis Press and the uh, founder and co-director of the Institute for Critical Social Theory. And today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a new publication by Dr. Rudolf J. Siebert. Uh, that new book is called Hegel and the Critical Theory of Religion, recently published by Ichperosis Press. And in this book, you'll find essays uh, from the 1970s up to the year uh, 2021 on Hegel and his influence on the critical theory and especially the critical theory of religion as uh, developed over the course of the last 50 plus years by Dr. Rudolph J. Siebert and others. So with that, Welcome, Dr. Siebert. Thank you for, uh, for doing this. Thank you. So um, what we're going to do today is just talk a little bit about the book. I got some questions for you, try to get a feel for the book, what's going on, some of the main themes, the main ideas in the book, um, so our listeners can, can uh, understand what they're getting into when they study the critical theory of religion and the Hegelian influence in it. So uh, just a couple, first couple of questions about your background with Hegel. Um, how and, and, and when did you discover Hegel? Well, only very late. So we never talked about Hegel in our family, certainly. Uh, I come from a working class family. My father was an electrician and my mother was a typist in a Jewish shoe factory. And so what we talked about were everyday things, were frankfurters and hamburgers and uh, nice practical things, but philosophy never came up and art never came up, but there was religion. So I grew up as a Catholic, we went to mass every Sunday and we had our prayers, but there was never any philosopher entering our discourse. So particularly not Hegel. Also in the elementary schools, I started with a school in 1933, so the schools became more and more fascist and there was no word about Hegel in the elementary school or then in the gymnasium in the, uh, I went to the Lessing Gymnasium and we learned Latin and Greek and Hebrew and these were the languages Hegel had also studied, he was also a philologist in these old languages. So he should have come up, but he never came up. So uh, throughout my uh, education in Nazi Germany from 1933 to 1945, there was never any talk about Hegel. So, but one event happened when I heard this name the first time, and that came from um, a, a communist, a member of the Communist Party which under liberal Weimar government, it was permitted, but under Nazism, uh, the Communist Party was forbidden and many communists were put into concentration camps. And so I met this Mr. Müller when he had just come out of Dachau, the concentration camp of Dachau. And we stood at the corner of our uh, settlement, which was called the Peace, and uh, in the distance, there was a bombardment of the city of Mainz by the American Air Force during daytime. And I had this stupid idea. I wanted to go with my bike over there to Mainz and look what a bombed out city looked like. And then, of course, my friend Müller, the communist, saw that was an idiotic idea and that the bombers would come to Frankfurt soon, maybe next week. And then I could see it all in Frankfurt. And, that was all very unbelievable to me. But suddenly our discourse turned to, to Hegel. He said, have you ever heard about this great philosopher Hegel? And I said, no. And he became outrageous. And he said, you are leader of the Catholic youth movement here in town and you haven't heard about Hegel and you go to a humanistic elite gymnasium and you haven't heard about um, about Hegel, it is shameful and so on. So he told me the first time the name and a few things about him. And that was practically my introduction, but that was very isolated. Nothing happened before, nothing happened afterwards. And it was only after I returned from American prison camp in Camp Allen to Frankfurt that then 
I slowly came in contact with Hegel, and that particularly through the Frankfurter Hefte, which was a left-wing Catholic uh, journal by Walter Dirks and by Eugen Kogon, the author of the SS State, who had also been in a concentration camp near Weimar in Buchenwald. And in the Frankfurter Hefte, then there came people up, uh, authors who were on the left, on the Hegelian left, and they then mentioned together with Marx, also Hegel, and then I became more and more familiar with him. <clears throat> now, you mentioned the Hegelian left, and this is something that a lot of people hear about, that somehow after Hegel, almost all philosophy, political philosophy especially, becomes Hegelian left or Hegelian right. Um, what does that mean, the Hegelian left? Well, it meant that Hegel's philosophy was a great synthesis of many, of many antithesis, of many antagonisms. So the antagonism between the individual and the collective, or between Catholic and Protestant, or between uh, uh, the um, uh, working class and the bourgeoisie. And so Hegel had somewhat created a gigantic type of a synthesis not only of many different philosophies, but also of all these antagonisms which characterize the modern world. And after him, there was nobody who could hold on to the synthesis anymore, and it broke apart. So on the Hegelian left, we had people who then used Hegel's dialectical logic. On the right, this logic was rejected. So. The left represented the working class, the right represented the bourgeoisie and the nobility. So instead of dialectics on the left, we have then positivism, the positivistic um, uh, uh, logic on the right, which was practically a continuation of the Aristotelian logic in different forms. So that is the right and the left. And there was something like a center, um, uh, which some people follow to were very close to Hegel's theology still. So, but the, the center was weak, but very strong became the left and the right. And then later on, it was called the praxis philosophy on the left, and it was called positivism then on the right. And uh, so that uh, divided the whole European culture then, and still does up to the day. So people say, we don't want to talk without right and left anymore. But it doesn't help because it is simply part of our reality. And we hear it on television all day long, where the left talks about the right and the right talks about the left. So Fox News on the right, for instance, also then recently talked about Hegel, and that was astonishing. They usually fight about Marx and Marxism, and so does the Eternal Word, which is a Catholic Fox News. And so there, but suddenly they recently they started out to attack Hegel as well. And that was astonishing. Yeah, especially considering how, you know, let's be honest, deep religious Hegel was. I mean, throughout his whole philosophy is the theodicy, a theological question, a theological concern, which is something that you have continuously brought to the forefront of your discourse on, on Hegel. From the 19 really 1970s late maybe late 60s up until the modern period and so I, I think the oftentimes the critique of Hegel coming from the right has something to do with the dialectical logic that you've talked about that you just mentioned or this concept of Aufheben uh, determinate negation how does determinate negation play a role in in Hegel's uh in Hegel's philosophy well I mean, the question is why Hegel was persona non grata in fascist Germany or fascist Europe, and why it was that also in the United States since the Great Depression. What is it in Hegel which is so uncomfortable or what has to be rejected up to the day by Fox News? And Fox News gave an indication of it. They said recently, it was just two weeks ago, they said it was the concept of becoming. And so they let the cat out of the sack in a certain sense, they were truthful for a moment. It is really the concept of becoming and Hegel got that from Heraclitus. So we have in his logic, in the beginning of his logic, we have these three philosophers. We have Parmenides who represents being and we have Buddha who represents nothing. 
And then we have the synthesis. We have Heraclitus with his idea of becoming. Everything moves, pantare, and patea polymos pantea, so pantone. That means war, that means conflict, that means antithesis is the father of all things. So that um, uh, this becoming now means the following thing. In all social system of exploitation, like slavery or feudalism or capitalism, the um, workers or the slaves or the serfs are made to believe that their system and their masters will be forever. Uh, even today, masses of the workers think that capitalism will be forever or that there can be nothing good after capitalism, that it is somehow the final system. So to shake this, this faith that it, the system will be forever, that is dangerous because it is important for the stability of the system that the masses who live in there believe that it will be forever. And so we have in fascism this fanatic attempt to keep capitalism forever. That is the task of fascism. And so therefore fascism comes up in opposition to communism or socialism who want to determinately negate, who want to negate the capitalistic system and go to something else socialism or communism or whatever. So that is the struggle in which we find ourselves in the 20th century and now again in the 21st century. And that is why it doesn't go away because underlying is a system which is deeply dualistic where we have the few who appropriate privately collective surplus labor of the many and that fundamental contradiction creates those responses all the time. And so socialism is a response to this contradiction and fascism is a response to this system. That is sometimes why the right or um, Trump and so on uh, say socialistic things like uh, you are, um, have nothing to lose or I am the voice of the voiceless or whatever. So both movements on the right and the left respond to the antagonism between the classes, which is an antagonism between private appropriation of collective surplus labor and collective appropriation of collective surplus labor. So private and collective, that is the antagonism. And this antagonism is supposed to be resolved in the collective appropriation of collective surplus labor in many different forms like the Yugoslav self-management system or the Soviet system or the Cuban system or the Venezuela system or, or the Nicaragua system and so on. There are many, many ways to do that more or less effectively. Yeah, so would you say that, that you know, had, had Hegel never had a mark, he would be a, a new Heraclitus? talking about the, you know, the process of history becoming, that it's always changing, that it's always has, maybe has a telos, right? Um, that the, the change already is there, it's, it's, it's ingrained, it's entelechy, but yeah. somehow Marx is the one that takes that kind of um, very almost like spiritual world geist idea and makes it concrete. And therefore it becomes about class. It becomes about class struggle. It becomes about changing, as you said, or overthrowing the capitalistic system. So is it Hegel or is it Marx or is it both of them that really is the threat to, to the capitalist, let's say, status quo? Well, I mean, Fox News is on the right track there. So of course, um, Marx knew that Hegel was the greatest, greater thinker, of course. And he confessed that Hegel was his teacher. He had a controversy with him. And the controversy was that he changed his notion dialectics into a reality dialectics, which Hegel had also already. But so he emphasized this reality dialectics. But the idea of freedom and that with inner necessity that freedom would finally be achieved. And no matter what feudal lords, capitalists or slaveholders or whatever do, <laughs> they come and they go. And that is the dangerous part. They will go. And the, the capitalists will go as the feudal lords had to go. And the capitalists didn't make them go through the guillotine and as the slaveholders went and so on. So it is this inner necessity, which is strangely enough an a priori thing. It is metaphysical. 
Marxism is anti-metaphysical up to Habermas, post-metaphysical, but they kept, Marx at least kept this metaphysical element, not Habermas, but Marx did the metaphysical thing. So with internal necessity, the historical process moves forward. No matter what fascists will do, no matter what socialists will do, it will uh, reach finally this goal, the realm of freedom on the basis of the necessity of nature and the necessity of economics. So um, there is, a, is an inheritance. And um, so what Marx did was determinately negating Hegel into his historical materialism. And Engels, of course, said that all idealism is religion, that religion is all idealism. He identified both of them. So, um, and uh, Marx, of course, followed him, and they both followed Feuerbach, who listened to Hegel's philosophy of religion twice, even, and then came up with his own projection theory in terms of religion. So, yes, I mean, Hegel was a deeply religious person still, and Karl Barth has seen that. Karl Barth thought Hegel should become the Thomas of Aquinas of the Protestants, and I always thought that Hegel should become the Thomas of Aquinas for Catholics and Protestants, for Protestants and Catholics, and so on. So if that can still happen is another question which is open. So um, nevertheless, uh, so that is the relationship to of Marx and Hegel. Marx indeed is a Hegelian through and through, but also a Kantian. His father was a Kantian, Marx's father. The director of his high school was a Kantian. So. The Kantian influence is very great in, in Marx, but particularly Hegel. And so in that case, uh, for once, Mark, uh, the Fox News is on the right track. Yeah, you don't see that very often. Yeah, right. <laughs> but as you say, every now and then, even someone like a fascist can tell you right. the truth, right? Yeah, right. And, and one has to, our discourse has to be open that the truth can really happen on the right, on the left, and in the center. And one must not simply say, because a right winger says this, therefore it's not true. Mm -hmm. Or because the church says it, therefore it's true. Because something is true, therefore the church says it, and not the other way around. So that is a very important principle. <clears throat> yeah, so one of the things that, um, in studying the Frankfurt School, it's the Frankfurt School is oftentimes called a, a neo-Marxist school of thought. And of course, there's a lot of other influences there. There's, you know, like you said, the influence of Kant, there's the influence of Nietzsche, uh, there's the influence of Judaism as well. I, I, I wrote about that, you've written about that. Um, but there's, you know, not a whole lot of works demonstrating the, the clear, what I think is very clear and important connection between the Frankfurt School and Hegel. Um, now, how did how did Hegel influence, or in what ways did Hegel influence the first generation of the Frankfurt School, such as Adorno and Horkheimer and Benjamin and Leuventhal and Marcuse? Yeah. Well, I mean, here again, you know, sometimes the right may be right and the left may be right. So, um, Horkheimer um, invented that word critical theory, and to be honest, it was a cover name. So it was a cover name for Marxism, for Marx. And so the Frankfurt School was called, you know, by the folk people in Frankfurt where I grew up. I grew up just 10 minutes away from the Frankfurt School Institute. So it was called the Café Marx. And um, this may be a prejudice, but there was some truth in it. So Marx obviously plays an important role. But then what um, Horkheimer really studied was Kant. So he draws a dissertation and habilitation everything on Immanuel Kant. And there's nothing about Hegel, first of all. So um, Hegel comes through through Adorno, then particularly. That means um, Adorno, when he writes his own aesthetics on art and music and so on, goes chapter by chapter practically through Hegel's philosophy of art. And uh, with Habermas, we have the same thing then. Um, Habermas uh, comes from Schelling to a large extent, like Paul Tillich came from Schelling, but um, as he does his life work up to his last uh, uh, book on the history of philosophy, which just came out two years ago, 
um, it is, he goes through the work of Hegel and uh, except one thing, he leaves out the philosophy of history. He replaces it by evolutionism. And it would be interesting to ask why that is the only thing which he left out. Um, if it was too optimistic, if it couldn't be handled and whatever, whatever the reason was, the, um, the Horkheimer still talks about Hegel's philosophy of history and Adorno too, but uh, with Habermas it's left out. But what Habermas does and what Marx had done before was the following thing. As the system breaks down, Hegel's system, and it breaks down because of his theodicy. It breaks down for that what Schopenhauer had called his cursed optimism. That is why the Hegelian system breaks down for the left. And then they pick up the pieces or whatever. But what the strategy really is that they go behind Hegel's system. They do not want to be systematic at all. They may become a little bit systematic, but they, they don't intend to become systematic. But they start out with the five human potentials on which Hegel had built his system. And they go back behind the system to these potentials or evolutionary universals of language and memory, of work and tool, of sexual love, of uh, the struggle for recognition and community. So then you can see that every of those post-Hegelians comes from one of those particular um, potential. So Freud concentrates on sexual love and Marx concentrates on work and tool and Habermas then concentrates on language and memory and the uh, um, struggle for recognition and his student then concentrates completely on the, uh, the struggle for recognition. So um, that is the strategy which is behind all of this. Uh, and with the system, of course, falls the theology of the system and the theodicy of the system, all that collapses for the left. And to some extent, it also collapses for the right. And uh, at least of all, it collapses for the center. Hmm. So, you know, we brought up Habermas. Would you say Habermas vacillates over the course of his over the course of his uh, academic career from Kant to Hegel, or is he primarily a Kantian or well, where does he well, fit? They, so. Yes, I mean, Habermas and Taylor, his good friend in, in England there, they vacillate between Kant and, uh, uh, Kant and Hegel. It goes back and forth. What does Hegel say about this? What does Kant say about it? And then they try to find their own way. Um, between the two. So, but uh, as far as the overall structure is concerned, Hegel is dominant still uh, beyond Kant. And then comes Fichte in between two and Schelling, they play in important role. So Habermas, so Habermas Schelling is also very important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, I have a question because I remember you told me this story quite a few years ago and it was quite humorous. And it's something that, you know, I've only found one reference in one book on Hegel in, and it was there. So it's not something that came out of thin air, but it was the, the story of, of Hegel and discussing or talking about the Eucharist and a mouse. Yeah. What is this story? Yeah, it was a big scandal in Berlin. So Hegel was already in Berlin and he taught the philosophy of religion. And in philosophy of religion, he finally came after all the other world religions, he came to Christianity. And in Christianity, he came through the Middle Ages, Catholic Middle Ages, and then to Protestantism. And uh, so he wanted to explain what the difference between the Catholic and the Protestant teaching on the Eucharist was. And so there, what had happened was on one side, we had the Catholic uh, theory of the Eucharist, that means that uh, the idea of transubstantialization. Transubstantialization means that in the bread and the wine, the accidents, what is visible, remains the same, but the substance in the bread and the wine changes into the body of Christ and in the blood of Christ. And it happens through the power of the Holy Spirit who descends, so the, the transcendence breaks into the imminence on the altar. It's not the priest who changes the, uh, the bread and wine. 
but it is the spirit who changes bread and wine. And then comes the, the words of Jesus that this is my body and this is my blood. And he gives it to his disciples as a new covenant and so on. But during the Reformation, then a split occurred between uh, Luther, who was a great theologian, and really saint material in his own way. And he talked then about consubstantialization. Consubstantialization means he brought the subject in. But somehow in the medieval theology and praxis, the objectivity of the body of Christ, whom one can put into a tabernacle or into a monstrance and so on, became so powerful that the subject disappeared. So the Trent Council had to make laws against priests celebrating the mass alone, even without an altar boy. So then they made the law that at least one or two people had to be there and somebody prayed. So the Trent Council already tried to uh, satisfy Luther by putting people in there, but it was not enough. So that means for Luther, the transfiguration takes place not only objectively, he holds on to that, but subjectively by the faithful subject who uh, participates in the consecration of the bread and the wine. And that was called consubstantialization. And then the other reformers, Flacius Illyricus from, from Yugoslavia, and um, also uh, the uh, uh, Calvin and Swingley and so on, came to other solutions and they met and Luther said, you have a different spirit because for <coughs> Calvin and Swingley and so on, it became entirely symbolical. There had been the historical event uh, of the Pasha Mir, um, of the year 30 and uh, then the, what happened on the altar was simply a symbolical affair. There was no objectivity left anymore. So you have that extreme objectivity of Catholicism you have Luther's synthesis of the objectivity and uh, subjectivity, which the Catholics should have really had, should have taken over. They should have taken over more of the reformers, which would really have helped if the Jesuit, Jesuitic, Jesuitic uh, uh, um, counter-reformation had not taken place. So, so we have the Catholic objectiv objectivism. We have the attempt to bring object and subject together in Luther, that is why Hegel thought that he repeated Luther on a higher intellectual level, but in the meantime, the notion had been discovered and one could synthesize the two. But then the other extreme was then extreme subjectivity. That means where nothing objective was left anymore except of the symbolism. And so in Germany, you had two groups then you had the Lutherans who had this consubstantialization and you have the Calvinists who had the symbol, symbolism and the king of Prussia then thought it was too expensive to have two churches. So they put them together into one church and my grandfather belonged to that. And he never knew what he did when he took communion or if it was now uh, Lutheran or if it was Calvinistic or so. And he didn't care very much about it in any case. It's a very so scholastic, scholastic affair. And, it has very little to do with what, what people do really uh, during the Eucharist. And I think in that, so that debate that- to the mouse. Yeah, let's get to the mouse there. <laughs> now, now comes the mouse. Because in order to make clear what the Catholic objectivism means, he said that when part of the host falls down and the mouse eats it, then the Catholics have to kneel before the mouse. And he even went into Latin uh, because that was too bad. Even when the mouse defecates, then the Catholics still have to kneel before that as well. So it was Latin so that most people wouldn't understand it, but it was bad enough. So, and then the Bishop of Berlin, he protested to the cultural minister who was a good friend of Hegel. <laughs> and um, well, the cultural minister then said that Hegel has to somehow apologize. And, so he did apologize a little bit by excusing himself. <laughs> he said, you know, he had to make it clear, things clear as much as possible to his students, as they say, or said recently, to bring the straw to the goat, <laughs> to, you know, to make it clear to people. One of uh, the eternal words said that recently, 
the father Mitch said that he said that what we have to do is to bring the straw to the goat. <laughs> that means to bring it down to the poor people. It's a very arrogant type of, of a statement of academicians and should never be repeated again. So nevertheless, in order to make it clear, Hegel said he had to, uh, he had to bring those examples. And, um, and that is how, how the whole thing ended, except a priest was once coming to his lectures and he was sitting before him and he looked at Hegel all the time and Hegel said, you cannot stare me away from my chair. <laughs> and then the priest left and he never came back again. So I had discussions in Berlin with, um, with communists and so on, um, who thought that uh, Hegel, you know, was not open for discourse really. And uh, that was true in a certain sense. He, um, he had great Catholic sympathies. So his system is not either or, like the Protestants think, but it was as well as. So he had a, a, a crypto-Catholicism in him. And I think there were even times when he thought of converting with other romantic friends to um, convert to Catholicism, but the Catholics looked too ugly to him. Particularly the clergy looked ugly. <laughs> he had something against the eunuchs or whatever. He was not a eunuch. He was one of the first philosophers with Fichte who got married. Otherwise in England and Europe, uh, professors did not get married. They all lived in celibacy, like the, the monks in the Middle Ages. So, um, so nevertheless, that was the, uh, <clears throat> his um, thing with, with Catholics uh, was, uh, was somewhat precarious. There was sympathy. But he always emphasized that he was a Lutheran and that he wanted to remain a Lutheran and uh, so that he was a pantheist or whatever was a horrible misunderstanding of the Catholic Church in terms of, uh, of Master Eckhart, but then of Hegel too. So why they rejected it was he was a pantheist. And so there is a little word, which a little difference which they overlooked, namely pantheism and panentheism. Panentheism means all and one. So pantheism means that the one and all become identical. There is no difference anymore. But for Hegel, the difference is there. And so it is for Eckhart. So the um, father inquis inquisitors and so on overlooked that. And, and, and poor Eckhart is uh, excluded since now, since 700 years or whatever. And no change has been made. And it's repeated and repeated again and again. And one doesn't know why they cannot grasp that difference between pantheism, where one and all is, is identical, and cannot see that there is also a difference. That means there is identity and difference between the two. So when Jesus said, look at the little birds, the Heavenly Father feeds them, or look at the flowers, how beautiful they bloom, and the Heavenly Father does it, and so on. The Heavenly Father will feed you. So there is the one which is present in all, in a certain sense, because he doesn't do it himself. God feeds the little sparrows through having seeds in the flowers and so on. So it's a mediated type of a system, but there is identity. God is present. Uh, Christianity is much closer to pantheism than to deism, but there is at the same time also a difference, and that difference has been overlooked by the Father Inquisitors out of some reason or the other. It was a whole scandal with Eckhart already and then with Hegel and other idealists that, uh, that comes up again and again. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, is pretty clear through reading a lot of the, the essays that are in this book is that there is a theodicy running straight through Hegel's entire corpus of work. And theodicy is, is, for whatever reason, it's a, it's a concept or it's a subject that people either don't want to talk about or have a feeling about, but have no idea that there's been systematic, you know, discussions of it, thinking about it, uh, philosophizing about it. But it, it's clear that somewhere, um, even when it's not right prevalent, right up in the forefront of what Hegel's talking about, there's that theodicy that runs just completely through his entire corpus. But what is the theodicy and, and, and how, does it, um, how does it determine or at least color the trajectory of, of Hegel's thinking? 
Well, I mean, theodos is a Greek word and means theos means God, DK means justice. So the problem is God's justice in the face of the injustices in his world. So it is the goodness of God, the freedom of man, and the origin of evil. That is the problem. And theology was originally theodicy. So in Greece, theology was the defense of the gods and of God, Zeus or Jupiter or whatever in Rome. Um, and when bad things happened, how could these bad things happen? Did God let them happen? And if he lets them happen, that with him, with God, meant at the same time, he willed it. So how can God will these bad things and so on? So, but then as theology and became Christian theology, there were Manique type of, uh, of uh, theologies, which divided the Old Testament of the bad God from the New Testament with the good and loving God. And it was rejected by the church and rightly so. And they were Gnostic writings which went in the same direction. But the problem was seen for a long time, but then it somehow, uh, it was forgotten that theology is the odyssey fundamentally, and people wanted to see it less and less. And so that the enlightenment took uh, advantage of it then, and the religious people forgot it. So I came back from the civil war in Yugoslavia, where I went for five years and brought money and food and so on for medicine for people. Uh, for the victims there. So it cost the lives of 200,000 uh, um, people uh, in Yugoslavia in the six different republics. And uh, so it was a horrible butchery. And once I came from Yugoslavia through Frankfurt and I went to confession in Frankfurt to a Capuchin church there, the monks. And, and I started our discussion with the father confessor. And I said, I'm coming out of that slaughterhouse there. And where's your boss? Where is God in all of this? And he didn't know what the word theodicy meant, but he knew the problem. So, and then he said, well, that is the cost of the world and we have to take our cross upon ourselves. And that means then reconciliation at the end of the world or whatever. But he had no uh, real theoretical answer. So he had a practical answer like imitation of Christ and so on but uh, he had no uh, real uh, objective answer. And there's no religion today which has an adequate theoretical answer. But Hegel tried once and his whole system is an answer to the theodicy and that enraged the Schopenhauer, his arch enemy uh, so much that Schopenhauer also taught in Berlin and uh, people were more attracted to Hegel. So he made a test, he put his class at the same time, and Hegel had his glasses and nobody came to him. And so he just despaired and he went to Frankfurt and never taught again, but just wrote on his volumes, the four volumes um, on the will and uh, the world as will and uh, representation. And um, so never married and hated women, but he did propose once and was rejected. And uh, so maybe that's why he never did it again. But so, uh, nevertheless, so this is the um, uh, Schopenhauer rejected this. Schopenhauer is the father of Occidental pessimism. And, um, but the two have in common <clears throat> the description of the horror and terror of history. And Hegel makes it very clear that in no sphere <clears throat> of reality is it so hard to justify God's goodness and so on. Um, as in this sphere of, uh, of history. It is still much easier maybe in personal life and so on. But even there, we had a deacon recently who uh, uh, every, started every sermon he gave, God is good, and the community answered, God is good, and so on. Then he was horribly beaten up in the parking lot and so on. But he had to go to the hospital. But two weeks later, he preached again and said, God is good, and didn't say why that happened to him and so on. So, it is present among uh, simple people, but uh, it has no name and one doesn't want to talk about it. It uh, doesn't make you feel good and, and so on. So they leave it out. And even theologians like Gregor Baum or Walter Dirks and so on, he, uh, Eugen Kogon, because of his horrible experience in the concentration camp, wanted to have a whole issue of the Frankfurter Hefter about the theodicy and Walter Dirks uh, rejected it. 
it was not done. And uh, they had a big conflict and Walter Dix even wept and he went to another room uh, and he said, you know, the happiness of individual doesn't mean that you can only be happy if you have been in the concentration camp. And then Kogon came and made peace with him and said, look, Walter, let's go on. And it was never, there was never a number, uh, an issue on that. But I talked with Walter Dix about that and he said, I have suffered a lot, but I, I did not want to talk about it, and so I'm very, very honestly. So, uh, but uh, so in a certain sense, uh, um, um, Hegel repeated the uh, last great the Odyssey of Leibniz. Um, Leibniz had been uh, laughed out of the court by uh, by the Candide of Voltaire. Uh, the whole world laughed about it. So he made little, you know, little fun about how purposeful things are and God had arranged everything, even the top of a wine bottle and, and whatever. And so, and Hegel enjoyed uh, Voltaire uh, and his joke about, about this uh, the Odyssey. And uh, even today, it's Candide is still played in our stages. And once it was played here in Kalamazoo and the priest wanted me to attack it. And, I was not able to do so because Voltaire was right. So, um, so Schopenhauer and Hegel have that in common. History is an awful place. And it is very, very hard to defend uh, the, the, the rationality of it or that anything divine could be in this horrible butchery. You just have to turn the television on and there was a new assassination. They killed an ISIS guy again. <clears throat> and have no problems with it, with international law, morality, or whatever. I had once um, a priest Rico here, he wanted to assassinate the head of state of Venezuela, <clears throat> and I protest against it, and I said, well, there's nothing in the New Testament about assassination of uh, heads of state, and so on. So, Rico then disappeared from Kalamazoo, and he worked then in the Acton Institute in Grand Rapids, which wants to bring Catholics and capitalism together. And he just retired. I think I found an article of him somewhere. <coughs> so now, um, so the, the strange thing that, first of all, Hegel enjoyed the fun which Voltaire made about Leibniz, but then he reconstructed Leibniz, but now on a, a dialectical level. He applied his dialectical logic, and what does that look like? <clears throat> when Hegel looks at the horrible things which have from day to day, but the international murder, the spying, the lying, like, like the lies about Ukraine, every day, every day, these lies are raining down. The American government says the Russians are coming. The people in Kiev say, no, the Russians are not coming. It is just uh, an attempt of a, a regime change again, and the lies are horrible. So the issue of international stealing and then the international killing for the stealing and then the lying about the stealing and the killing and so on, this is just awful. So how can one deal with this? So Hegel would say with Schopenhauer, his enemy, oh, you have to look at this thing, you know, more people go under daily whole civilizations of the highest level, like the Greeks and so on, go under. So, so many beautiful things are destroyed and, and are left in ruins and so on. But then Hegel makes some kind of a shift of consciousness, which you no know, modern scientists can do. He shifts from the a priori approach to the, uh, from an a posterior point of view, to a, a, poster, a, a priori point of view. That means he tells people to change their consciousness and turn to the beginning, namely to the sentence of the uh, Epimenides, reason governs the world, God's reason governs the world, and to the, uh, to the Psalms and the prophets of the three Abrahamic religions of Judaism and so on, and uh, that uh, providence governs the world. And that not only in general and abstractly, but concretely. That means reason governs the world, providence governs the world into everything particular, and even into the singularity. 
so that there is almost no contingency or accidentality so that uh, there is it, it can happen that things are contingent and accidental but usually the god's uh, providence goes into this singular life of people and what happens to them from day to day as it goes through the great man when they make history and, and so on. And now there comes, of course, for us today, Auschwitz, and it comes the Hitler empire, and it comes the, the um, issue of Barbarossa, the attack, uh, the invasion of uh, Russia, and the killing of 6 million Jews, and uh, the uh, killing of 26 million Russians, supposed to be all communists, and so on this unbelievable mass murder. Of course, they murdered throughout history, but the technology allowed such a large amount of people to be killed, this mass killing and such. So can Hegel still today, or could he at Marx's time, still answer the theodicy question? And what is it? How does he answer it? So first would be that reason governs the world or providence governs the world. And reason has a purpose, and that purpose is the realm of freedom, which then Marx takes over to. And this realm of freedom is then reached by means, and the means are the great men, the great men make history. But for Hegel, the great men and the masses together make history. And then for Tolstoy, only the masses make history. And uh, for Hitler, uh, it's a great man theory, only the great man make history and not the masses. It's right. For Marx, only the masses of the workers make history, not the great man. And so, so there are variations. So nevertheless, they are the means and they make history they, uh, unconsciously very often. That means they may have their own power or what at mind uh, to increase, but um, uh, in reality, they do something else. And Hegel is a, uh, Hitler is a very good example. He wanted to make Europe and Germany great again. He asked England to participate, England refused and so on. He wanted to solve the European overpopulation problem by opening up the Russian uh, areas. It's wonderful when you fly over Russia. We did both, we flew over it. You see that tremendous land and fertile land and so on and uh, not enough is done with it and so on. And so the, masses in Western Europe and then this open space to the East. So therefore he wanted to make Europe great again. He wanted the British to have a fleet and the colonies in Africa. He wanted a little bit of colonies in Africa too, but he, mainly he wanted to have colonized, he wanted to colonize the East up to the Ural, or up to the, uh, the, the uh, yeah, up to the Ural and, and then um, divided all up and it, the network was already there, street to uh, Petersburg and street to Moscow and uh, street to Stalingrad and so on or to Kiev. So uh, the, um, it was all planned and there would be German soldier, soldier farmers, they would be ahead and then the Slavs would all do the work. They would be fed well and uh, the birth control down to two per person, they would replace themselves and so on. It was all planned out and, and so on. So, that he had in mind, but by declaring war against the two front runners of history, namely the Slavic world and the American world in Pearl Harbor and so on, uh, that was then he did produce the opposite, namely he sent Europe into retirement, that Europe, which should be a new world historical power, became moved into, into the niche mm. of world history where it is now. So. It, and as it shapes up now, Putin was just in picking. Um, so we have now the Slavic world with China as a background, and we have the American world with Europe as a background. And the dualism develops, which uh, hopefully that the competition will be a competition of who has no slums, who has better health insurance, who has better education, where people, where, where do people live longer and so on so that the two worlds, the American and Slavic world, compete with each other and the others can then choose which model they would like to follow and so on. So that was the idea. Reason governs the world. It governs the world toward a goal within a necessity. It, govern, it does this through the, the great man who may be more or less aware of, uh, of their passions 
Their passions may blind them, but they do the right thing, even unconsciously, together with the masses or without them. And then they do that in the material, namely in the social systems. It, it means a change of family, a change of civil society, a change of the state, a change of culture, of art, religion, and so on. And, uh, and that goes in stages. And for Hegel, it is the freedom of one, the freedom of few, the freedom of all. <laughs> and for Marx, it is then the food pickers and the hunters and fisher and the slave holders and the feudal lords and the capitalists and the socialists and the communists and so on. <laughs> so that is where, uh, Hegel, where Marx changes the, the idealistic system with the a priori um, into a, a posteriori system, a scientific system, so, so to speak, more closer to the, the Marx has positivistic elements. Maybe everybody has to have positivistic elements. Uh, positivism means facts and statistics and so on. What is wrong with positivism is that it stays with those facts and data and does not ask if they are good or bad and if they are should maybe change. So then we know what's going on in our slums, but we stop with knowing how many people are in our slums. Then we don't ask if they ought to be in those slums or if it is inhuman to be in those slums and that therefore we have to change those slums. And so since we are positivists, we have slums since 200 years in every town of this, of this nation and in between the world slums on top of it and so on. So, um, so that uh, was Hegel's theodicy. And he thought that not religion, but that philosophy was ultimately the theodicy and that his philosophy in which so many philosophies were determined negated, which makes him so unbelievably complex, but also concrete in his sense. Um, the concreteness, it's interesting, the civil society now is still very abstract. And the Gestapo, in order to find if somebody was a socialist, they counted how many somebody would, how many times somebody would say concrete. If he said concrete all the time, they knew, aha, that's a socialist. He wants to go to a more concrete society, a more complicated society than when things, concrete means congress to work, go together. The more things go together, the more concrete they become. So porno is very abstract uh, in, in that sense. So something which is very sensuous can at the same time be very abstract. So there's a difference between everyday language and, and the philosophical language. So and uh, that is, of course, even this very complicated theodicy um, has come into question through the post uh, Hegel event. He, he thought that the Europeans should not make any wars anymore, that Europe had come to the end of its, of its priority and of its front runner position and um, that it was too late for the Europeans to make war, but they still made wars through the 19th century. And then they made the two biggest of all wars, the first and the second world war in a total crash. <clears throat> so that is uh, Hegel's philosophy of history and his theodicy. So if Hitler had been reading Hegel as opposed to Schopenhauer, he would have known that the, the age for European expansion and empire was already done. Yeah, right. right. And that an experiment which he could do, would do. So Barbarossa comes from Frederick II of Sicily, a very great medieval German emperor. So it was an, a medieval ideal uh, to restore the empire. Not the first empire of Barbarossa, the red beard, uh, not the second empire of Bismarck, but the third empire was again, and it cannot be done in history. Wherever people take a period centuries ago and try to bring a nation which moves into the niche, out of the niche again, ends either in a comedy or it ends in, in a tragedy. So, and in that sense, Hitler's thing was a comedy, but it was even more so a tragedy um, to, to uh, attempt that once more. 
Yeah, and we see that again, you know, with current movements, these retrotopian movements that are, you know, paleogenetic in the sense that the future of the nation is behind us. We have to make America great again the way it was before. We have to reproduce the past again into the future in order to bring it into uh, some kind of meaningful existence. And as you said, any attempt to do that, to, to somehow reverse the dialectic, and indeed determine it and negate something and bring that which is already negated back to the forefront that yeah. ends in tragedy or ends in farce right. or comedy yeah and so I, of course we we are you know a front runner now together with the uh, the Feder for the Russian Federation and uh, so the, therefore the uh, America is not going back as such the uh, where we could go back is to uh, to the capitalistic period of the 19th century and and to renew that again and that uh, we have that already you know before trump already this attempt to think that capitalism will have no crisis anymore and we can now deregulate and the new deal is not necessary anymore and that was the great mistake of Reagan, which was then and, and, uh, answered by the catast financial catastrophe of 2008. And each of those deregulation attempts will, uh, will have the same uh, result and so on. The, uh, the return now, Biden has returned to the uh, before Reagan and the tremendous government spending um, pumping into civil society in order to stabilize it. Um, that uh, showed that, you know, the Reagan thing was really a great mistake. So, so in that sense, but otherwise, you know, we don't want to go back hopefully to England or to Germany or to Egypt or whatever. So we are not in the niche. We are not in the niche. We will move into the niche someday, but I don't think I'm not that pessimistic that I think we we are done with or so. It is much too short for the uh, Slavic world and for the American world to uh, move already in retirement. Our retirement, I think, is far away from us. But our responsibility is enormous. In Europe, they can now go fishing and so on. But we have to do more than fishing here. And that is a tremendous educational job, which has to be done here now. Mm -hmm. You know, post Auschwitz, it became very clear, I think, for a lot of the Frankfurt schoolers, especially Adorno, um, when he wrote negative dialectics, that somehow the the cursed optimism, as Schopenhauer said of Hegel, that in some cases, no rose comes from the cross, no resurrection comes from the death on the cross, you know, nothing good comes out of the catastrophe, as was the case of, uh, of Auschwitz, you know, when, when, when that somehow the theodicy answers simply do not or are, are not adequate um, to, to see some kind of good coming out of this. The dead are dead and they can't be resurrected and there was no meaning whatsoever uh, to their deaths, to their slaughter. It seems that, that somehow the positive metaphysics of trying to see meaning, a, a good meaning uh, in this kind of catastrophe might not be sustainable after something like Auschwitz, uh, as Adorno would say. What do, you, what do you think about that? Yeah, so, I mean, the logic behind it is the dialectical logic. If you take the Fichte interpretation you know, of Hegel's dialectical logic, it is thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. So that means the synthesis was supposed to come with internal necessity. Um, that means um, the antagonism the antithesis would be overcome with inner necessity and there would be a good result. And somehow Marx has that and uh, also the Frankfurt School had it when they believed, you know, that the workers would rise against fascism. And um, so they made that, ex the, the statistics of from um, 1930, 32, 33, where they had 8,000 workers and to find out 
uh, how many, how much percentage of them were authoritarian, that means fascist personalities, and how many were revolutionary, which means democratic personalities. I'm just writing a book about this in terms of our present situation. And they predicted somehow, you know, that it was very possible that uh, fascism would win finally um, because they were about 12% authoritarian personalities. But they were also about 12% or 50% of uh, democratic or revolutionary personalities. So it could still go the other way. But then masses of workers were simply quiet and silent as the right took over more and more. <laughs> and then the Frankfurt School became more Schopenhauerian, more pessimistic. Um, and the negative dialectics is an outcome of this. That means it holds on to the dialectics, but it is not so sure any longer if the synthesis can be really reached. So there was this enormous war with 70 million people dead and fascism was really destroyed as it could not possibly be more destroyed militarily in Moscow where 10 million men were fighting against each other. And then of course in, in Stalingrad, but most of all in Kursk where 4,000 tanks were driving against each other and so on. So it was so thoroughly beaten that one would say it could never come up again. In the last days uh, in the uh, bunker in Berlin, Hitler said it would take centuries uh, until fascism would come back again. And he was wrong with that too, time-wise at least. So it came already back again after 80 years because of the continually deepening of the contradiction of the private and collective appropriation. That means the poor get always poor, more of them get poor, and part of the middle class sink down into the proletariat. And, and on the other side, the small and smaller groups and that not only with us, but also with satellites like in the Ukraine, where we have seven fascist oligarchs and the richest of them has seven and a half billion dollars and the poorest of him of them has one and a half billion dollars and so on. It's a fascist enterprise, the, uh, the Ukraine, which uh, our people are not fully aware of, whom we are really supporting there. I was often in Kiev and I couldn't stand it really because of the atmosphere which was there on Maiden and, and everywhere else. So <clears throat> nevertheless, that is, that is the problem. So it's not that they do not keep open for that the synthesis will really happen, but they have experienced it in the hard way that in this unbelievable first half of the 20th century, these efforts have been made in order to resolve the antagonism and it was not possible. So uh, Adorno's negative dialectics reflects that historical experience which the Frankfurt School had. In one of your essays in the book, you talk about Hegel's influence on the third youth movement of the 1960s. And I know you came to Western Michigan University in 1965, um, had recently moved before that to uh, the East Coast from Germany after you finished your studies there. And you moved right into West Michigan on the university, full of the counterculture at this tumultuous time, um, you know, where, where where Medgar Evers was killed, Jack Kennedy was killed later on, um, you know, Malcolm's killed in, in 1965, uh, Martin is killed in 68. This was a tumultuous time to be uh, on campus and on the university, and you're talking about Hegel, right? You're teaching about Hegel. So um, how, how, does, how does Hegel connect to the third youth movement of the 1960s? Yeah. So let me just go back for, for very shortly. The, the, um, I, I encountered the Frankfurt School practically before I encountered it theoretically when I returned to Germany in the prison camp. So I was a prisoner of war in the United States. And at the time, there was still the idea that all Germans had been fascists and the, the prisoners were treated that way. So there were 300,000 German prisoners here from the Africa Corps and 100,000 Italians, and they were all considered to be fascists, and they were too. 
the largest extent really fascist. But then there was a contact between the Frankfurt School and the New School with Mrs. Roosevelt. And the idea was brought up that not all Germans may have been fascists, but that they were a certain amount of people who could, why not, and could be used maybe for the reconstruction of a post-fascist state. And so I was at hearings with FBI, uh, or with the Secret Service, all Jewish, all from Germany, spoke all German better than I did, and knew Frankfurt better than I knew. And they knew about our activities in the Catholic Youth Movement and how we had helped uh, Jewish people and how we had spread the uh, encyclical letter of the Bishop of Münster against concentration camps, but also against saturation bombing. So um, nevertheless, the, um, uh, we uh, were then, after I was chosen and was categorized as an anti-Nazi, others were, were categorized as Nazis and others were categorized as war criminals. And it was done without violence, I must say, to the honor. There was no torture whatsoever. There was just very intelligent cross hearings in which they found out, let's see, a comrade of mine, what did you do? Which unit were you in? What did you do? Did you drive a truck? Yes, where? Near Kiev, I drove a truck near Kiev and so on. So who was on the truck car? There were people on the truck. What kind of people? And, so and suddenly they caught him in a network of cross hearing and so on. And the same thing they did with me. We were all a little bit stunned and whatever. Sometimes I didn't even know who the Pope was and so on. But nevertheless, the, uh, they found out and identified me as an anti-Nazi. And then I was trained in the critical theory in a certain sense, in a little bit funny way, because we said there is this lack of space. And they said, well, build skyscrapers and plant potatoes on top of them and you will solve the problem. <laughs> so, it was a little, but they were sociologists and they were good ones from famous universities who came and taught us and so on. And then I was sent back to Germany in order to do that, to transform the fascist state into, uh, into a liberal state. And the mistake was made in the State Department. They were all liberty ships and they had numbers, they had no name. So they sent the wrong number in the wrong place. The Nazi ship went to Hamburg and the anti-Nazi ship went to Bolbeck or to the Le Havre and from Le Havre to Bolbeck which was an American concentration camp for SS, but, and it was hell, the whole thing. So we had sea bags full of uh, stuff, for uh, chocolate and cigarettes to go to the black market in Frankfurt and then feed ourselves and then fight for democracy. You cannot fight for democracy without eating anything. So he took it all away, distributed among his coolies, played with his dog like an SS officer. And um, so we said we're all anti-Nazi, anti-Nazi. He said they all Germans were anti-Nazis and so on. So he sent us back in the tent, <laughs> tent were full of water, three dead people in the tent because they didn't tell him because they wanted to have the food of the dead ones because they were starving. French doctors came in and uh, sought people out for working in the mines or working in the mine fields in the Normandy where where the maps got lost and, and the arms and legs, everything were cut off by exploding mines. And so, which was all against international law. And I never had to complain about however I was treated. I was always treated well as a prisoner of war. I didn't get anything to eat in Worms for a whole week, but that was nobody's fault. That was a logistic problem. There were millions of people coming over here, soldiers and millions of prisoners. It could not be handled, that, nobody, that was nobody's fault. But I did go to the American military government in Frankfurt at the IG Farm building and complained bitterly about the, uh, the uh, uh, behavior against the Geneva Convention of keeping prisoners in that specific camp. And I don't know how many other of those camps existed, but nevertheless, after three weeks, then the State Department gave notice to the camp that we are we're really in the wrong place. And then we were sent to Frankfurt to hide on. I was released as a prisoner. And then I started um, in the political parties, the CDU and so on, started my work to do that. And so but between 1954 and then 1960, um, I went once more back to the United States in order to have courses in leadership and so on in order to continue my work. I promised to go back to Germany. I went back to Germany, did my studies and did this political work to transform this uh, with Eugen Kogon and Walter Dirks 
to transform the uh, state, um, Nazi fascist state into a liberal one, but not back into the Weimar model, but a new model. We wanted to have a different Christian democratic union where workers and Christians would be together. Then Adenauer came and uh, did a restoration politics in which then uh, Catholics and Protestant bourgeois got together into the CDU, which would further, further and further to the right. And then all the socialists were thrown out, the workers were thrown out, and the socialistic party became stronger, the communistic party was forbidden. And uh, so a completely different restoration model was, was produced. And it was foreseeable that if you produce another model like the pre-war model, it would do the same thing what the free model did, namely to uh, deepen the antagonism between the private and the collective appropriation and to deepen the abyss between the classes. And of course, one would have socialistic vo vo voices then and against them one would have the fascist movement again. And so that's what we have now. That is our situation now. And um, so that, uh, uh, that is the, uh, the, the background of your question, which you had, uh, which was what? It was uh, when you finally came here to the US, you came right in the midst of the 1960s. So by 1960 or so, uh, I had served now over a decade, in, the, uh, decade in, in Germany. And we thought that the danger of such a catastrophe would uh, be much greater in the United States than it would be in Europe. And that is when I decided then to come to the States. And I went to the Jesuit school first. I taught at the Yola College in Baltimore for three years. And there was the Vietnam War already uh, coming up. And I started you know, the uh, critical thinking in Baltimore already. I taught economics and theology at the same time. I wanted to talk, uh, teach the, um, the, uh, the social encyclical letters, but the Jesuits said, nobody does that. You cannot do it. You will lose all your friends. I said, you wrote them. Why don't you teach them? I said, well, I did teach them. I did not lose all my friends. So it wasn't so bad as it uh, went. And then the Jesuits thought um, when there was a lack here, uh, there was a choice I had. I could become a chair somewhere south of Chicago. And uh, then this opened up at Western Michigan University. And I was supposed to cooperate with a far, far right wing Jesuit, Father Harden. And, uh, but there was a trick involved. I was not to join him, but to replace him, which he didn't know, which I didn't know, but then he was replaced finally. So, and that was the time now where he had a very right-wing position to all what happened to the students and I had a very left-wing position. So I did not really base it on, uh, on uh, Hegel. It was for them two Hegelians, namely Marx and Bakunin, who were important for the students. So anarchism, it came up recently again that there are some anarchist people. So <laughs> Bakunin was a real tragic uh, case. Um, Bakunin was a nobleman in Russia who thought that Marx's idea would suffer from that, that when once you have a proletarian ruling class or the dictatorship of the proletariat and you would pose it against the, uh, the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, uh, you would never get rid of it. So therefore, in order not to thrive that way, he thought there should be no dictatorship of the proletariat but that there should be a new movement without leadership. And so we had students on campus who were anarchists and the uh, FBI had a hard time to find out who the leaders were. They, they were trained in that uh, authoritarian type of model. There must be leaders. So catch the leaders and you have the whole movement. There were no leaders. There was just a whole group of 20 and there was no leader. So. Um, that was very embarrassing and they had to change their whole strategy and technique when they came to my house and wanted to catch the leaders and they were no leaders. So, um, so that is the, um, how I got involved and I was then the connection between the universities in Detroit and here and that student movement. So revolutionary movement, which he, he had no contact with workers at all 
but it did have contact with workers in France. Uh, so it was, uh, well, it was a good and a serious attempt. I always taught the students, you know, to learn more about the system in which they lived because they thought they lived in a free system and they could freely uh, express themselves. And that was true in terms of theory, but as soon as they touched the barbed wire, that means they did something, then the system reacted, and like the shooting of the students and so on in, uh, in Mexico and here and in Japan and Germany. It was a movement which went from Japan through this country to Italy, Germany and so on. So um, it was, um, Rudi Dutschke and other people, Habermas took a very critical position to the movement. He uh, called Rudi Dutschke a red fascist and then withdrew it again later on and an uh, assassination attempt was made on Rudi Dutschke and so on. So um, nevertheless, the, uh, the students became somewhat disappointed. They were inspired by the Frankfurt School, but they also be became disappointed because they, their teachers were not revolutionary enough. They were not practical enough. And they were not revolutionary enough because they thought of the dangerous position that you destabilize West Germany and then the East becomes strong and marches in. And so so they, were, they thought that the time was not ripe for such a revolution in, in the present situation. And for the student, this to be patient and so on was just an attempt to not to do anything. And so they were then uh, frustrated with the teachers. They even tried to take over the Frankfurt Institute. They marched into it. The Adorno had to call in the police against his own students. And that was, of course, a great disappointment. So <laughs> Marcuse was one of the most active people who uh, fought against Reagan and gave speeches against him in Paris and here in this country and so on. He was the most active one, but then Reagan won and Marcuse died. And so um, it was not the revolution which uh, would have to happen or whatever could happen. It was not a, uh, prepared adequately. They were not adequately educated. They did not know what the system was like in which they were. And they knew even less how one could possibly change it, and even less into what. Because simply to say the family will wither away, the state will wither away, and religion will wither away, and absolutely nothing withered away, and absolutely nothing can wither away. It can be changed, but it cannot wither away. So here Hegel and the past was negated too abstractly, not only by Marx, but also by Lenin, and this too abstract negation of the old order then would use new problems, particularly in their policy concerning religion, which was disastrous. And uh, so, uh, and they themselves knew it there when they made people now into nice little atheists. They thought they wouldn't go to church on Sunday anymore in the Orthodox Church, but they would do something else worthwhile. And instead of that, they went to the soccer game. And uh, so, even for those teachers, though it was a disaster, that's not what they wanted. So, well, what the hell did they want? That is the question. And so, um, the, what the Frankfurt School corrected in a certain sense then was to look at um, religion and reject the regressive elements, the irrational elements and so on, but at the same time translate positive elements like love of the neighbor into solidarity or other things had been done before already. So to rescue, to not only to negate, but also to rescue religion in a new form of society, in a new form. It was not to wither away, but to be changed. And the same thing was true for the family and the same thing was true for the state. And so one could maybe have uh, avoided, you know, uh, first of all, one has to look at the greatness of the Soviet Union, which people hate to do, but even Hitler recognized that. Hitler flew to the Helsinki in a plane all by himself. <laughs> it, he did strange things. He flew to Helsinki in order to talk to Mannerheim, another fascist, and we have a record of it. We have a tape of it. 
and with his soft Austrian language, is very musical. He spoke very musical German, but not high German, but German with an Austrian dialect uh, accent. And he talked to Mannheim and he said, look, one has to respect a government which is able to put 20,000 tanks into the field in such a short time. He even had recognition for his arch enemy. Whenever we bring Hitler and Stalin together, we make a great historical mistake. These people are not the same. They are at the opposite pole of things and they were arch enemies and delivered to each other the most horrible, horrible battles which have ever been fought in human history before. So um, when you compare that there were 10 million men fighting in Moscow in one winter battle and that Eisenhower had 350,000 men in the Normandy, then you see what the balance is between the war in the East and the war in the West. So that is why Hitler did the Ardennes Offensive. He thought he should you know, shortly finish it up in the West and then would be free completely to fight the real arch enemy. Liberal was, liberalism was bad enough, but the communism or Marxism was the worst of all things which they're horrifying dialectics. And so the officers, the German officers and the uh, Russian officers had studied in the same institute near Frankfurt, the German warfare. And so the Germans were faced with their own practices, their own methods in Stalingrad, but with the addition of Chukov's um, dialectical thinking, which really did them in so that they could not close, uh, not break open the encirclement anymore and that Stalin what happened where a whole army was sick with one million men was slaughtered. So also that had never happened in, in world history and uh, even it was worse in, um, in Kursk where Chukov kept his tanks back in the forest and the Germans thought they had done it and he only started and was able to break open the encirclement and break out and never stopped until he was in Berlin. So, uh, um, so that as far as the uh, um, question is concerned, um, which we just dealt with. Yeah, last question for you. Um, Bertolt Brecht, towards the end of his life, living next to the Dorothean cemetery, read two books. He read the Bible and he read Hegel's logic. Why would he do that? What is the, what's the connection between the Bible and Hegel that would have someone like a Marxist playwright, Bertolt Brecht, reading these two volumes? Well, in a certain sense, you know, we have to speculate there because he himself didn't say much about that. So you have somebody who was an outstanding uh, playwright, you know, a Marxist playwright. And according to Eugen Kogon, you know, he was just one little meter away from Christianity. So it was something which a Christian should have said. So Mother Courage, you know, or the, uh, uh, his play on Ch Chicago, uh, St. John's uh, Backyard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so which couldn't be played in Chicago, you know, up to recently. And Western never wanted to play anything of Brecht. K College did, but Western only very recently came up and played Mother Courage. And uh, so he always had some excuse. It wouldn't be a business success or whatever, but it was just a right wing position. So nevertheless, he had his own unbelievable suffering. He uh, was not a Jew, as far as I know. He fled Germany because of his uh, plays which he had done in Berlin so he was known as a Marxist and he couldn't stay there anymore so he went to Russia took his girlfriend along she died in Moscow and he had to leave her behind and then he went to the United States and was in Hollywood and played there and uh, then when the, uh, um, the hearings came about in the, against Marxists and he had to go to Washington he was invited there to go there he made a deal with the lawyers and uh, what he would say when they would ask him, are you a member of the Communist Party? Have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And that he would say no, in spite of the fact that he had been a member of the Communist Party. 
but not of the American Communist Party, but of the German Communist Party. So he went to the year and they showed him a poem of him and they read it in English and said, I'd never heard of it. He said, <laughs> and had his cigar in his mouth all the time, which he, had, he could never stop smoking. So, and then they bought it in German. They said, oh yeah, I remember I, I wrote that. <laughs> Nevertheless, he had his ticket already in his pocket to go to, uh, to Switzerland. And so he was in Switzerland and then he was invited by the government in Pankow and went to the East sector and to got a nice house, by the way, and could uh, do his writings and would travel to the West all the time and his plays were played in the West and in the East. And, uh, but then came that tragic day when the workers in East Berlin rebelled against their own government. The government wanted to increase the production rate and um, turn the assembly lines faster. And, the workers then instigated by the Western, Western uh, Secret Service, which were all the old Nazis who had come back in the meantime. And so he was sitting there on the benches, seeing the workers marching and was very sad about it. But he never lost faith that the workers would finally win the battle after all and so on. So, but then in the last years of his life, he chose to move <laughs> out of his big house into that apartment above the um, the uh, cemetery which you mentioned and so lived there for a few years and um, during that time he read the bible he had read the bible all the time by the way throughout his life and he took stories from there and imitated it and, and so on so what was new what he had not done before as far as we know was that he read Hegel's phenomenology of the spirit which shows the development of human consciousness through the centuries from sense perception to understanding to reason. And uh, so, and uh, he was obviously uh, fascinated by this, but for him as a materialist, that was unusual because it was definitely um, an idealistic approach to this. So the emphasis on human consciousness, emphasis on spirit in, in general and so on. Uh, so he, um, he was somehow interested in this idealistic thing now, and this is unusual. He had said before, uh, men die like animals, and um, that is a materialistic position, and it solves the theodicy problem too. If we die like animals, so there is no theodicy problem anymore, neither. Um, Hans Küng then turned it around and uh, said, we do not die like the animals. And I think Küng was right. We, we do not die like the animals because we are conscious of that we have to die and that shapes and forms our whole life in our culture and so on. And there's nothing like that in our pets or whatever. Um, they have no clue what will happen to them except the last moments or whatever. So. After this extreme materialistic position, uh, it is somewhat unusual to go through the formation of human consciousness since we uh, moved from animality to, to some kind of a new species. Um, but then uh, it, it goes even further that he wanted to be buried besides Hegel. Why that? That, of course, means something. It doesn't mean fish, but with, Fichte is with his wife, also buried besides Hegel and his wife. And so he was not really buried beside him, but opposite him, but uh, very close. Uh, and uh, so that is astonishing. At the least what it means is that he considered uh, Hegel a great man, a great source. And, uh, but even Hitler, you know, who chose Schopenhauer and Maybe the world would have looked different if he had chosen Hegel, and we have no idea why he made that choice, but he had Schopenhauer in his back, back uh, throughout the First World War, and always in pauses between battles, he studied, um, he studied Schopenhauer, and uh, do you think of an American politician who could read Schopenhauer, or could uh, play piano, Wagner's music on the piano, and so on, so it was a little bit different type of a politician whom you have there. Maybe thanks be to God. <laughs> so, but nevertheless, um, the and up to the last days in the bunker where he talked about uh, 
discovers about Schopenhauer. And it would be interesting to know what in Schopenhauer, because there are two, three volumes about the will to life, and uh, one uh, volume about the redemption from the will to life in art and religion and philosophy. And it would be interesting to know which part of his work they, they discussed in the end. That means if they had any hope of redemption of any kind, or transmigration of the soul and so on, as Schopenhauer took from Buddhism and so on. So, but we have no idea what, what, it, what the content was. So, so nevertheless, that at least we can say that uh, he probably did not uh, recant, you know, his own materialistic position, but like Marx, you know, would, uh, would think highly of Hegel's greatness as a philosopher. And that is true today on the Hegelian right and the Hegelian left. They may be very critical of him and they may say that his system has broken down, but they all recognize his greatness. And uh, it is somewhat unfortunate that the public opinion is that he is dangerous or whatever uh, in the sense of becoming that, uh, that he is the Heraklatos of modern time, I think we better face it. There is becoming. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. So I would uh, like to thank you for doing this discourse uh, today um, on the new book, uh, Hegel and the Critical Theory of Religion, this book here published by Ekperosis Press. Um, so many of the things that we talked about today uh, are in this book, and someone can trace the whole development of the Hegelian thought through the critical theory of religion um, through this book. And so um, I appreciate it for doing this discourse. This was wonderful. I hope everybody who sees this uh, video can learn something about Hegel, the, the new Heraclitus. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so very much that we could have this discourse. Absolutely. The more discourse about Hegel, the better. Absolutely. And we can get big, nice big busts of Hegel like that, even, even greater. So nice. Okay, so our next discourse that we'll do with uh, Dr. Sievers is when this next book comes out on uh, inclusive and exclusive identities. We're working on that right now on the dialectics of the right and the left. And uh, so stay tuned. We'll, we'll do that next time. Very good. All Thank right. You. Yep, have a good day. Okay, same to you.